Hello everyone, welcome to a new real life story. Stay till the end and don't forget to subscribe to this channel so we can hit a thousand subscribers. It was early morning, and the taxi park's garage buzzed with activity. Amanda, a young cab driver, had been working under her car's hood for half an hour, unaware of her surroundings. Suddenly a deep voice interrupted her concentration. Hello, Amanda. It's early morning and you're already tinkering with your car. What's wrong? Do you need help? The girl broke away from her work, stood up and wiped the sweat off her forehead. She looked comical, with smudged engine oil on her nose, holding a dirty rag and wrench instead of a manicure tool. Hello, Barry. I've got it under control, thanks. There was an issue with the ignition, but I replaced the plugs and now it starts perfectly. Let me wash my hands and we can have some coffee. I haven't even had breakfast yet and I'm starving. Take out the cabbage pies I baked last night. Help yourself. Barry eagerly rubbed his hands together and savoured the treats. Oh, Amanda, you're wonderful. These pies are delicious. You can fix cars, bake pies, and you're beautiful. What a pity I'm married. And your fiancé is a fool. A smart girl like you should be cherished and protected. Amanda let out a heavy sigh, sat down beside him, took a sip of scalding aromatic coffee, and replied, Don't be offended, but men, they're all the same. They love you at first, then they disappear into thin air. Well, I don't need anyone. I'll save up money, have a child, and raise him on my own. Just don't tell Mr. Farris that I'm pregnant. That money-hungry jerk will kick me out. Before Amanda could finish her meal, the radio beeped, and the dispatcher informed her that she had to drive for a client. She shook hands with her colleague and drove off, humming a simple tune to herself. In reality, Amanda enjoyed working as a cab driver very much. The day was never boring, with interactions with different people and the opportunity to learn the latest news and interesting stories. However, there were occasional mishaps. If someone had told her three months ago that she would be working as a cab driver, she probably wouldn't have believed it. Amanda's childhood was spent in the countryside. Her mother passed away when she was only five years old due to a severe kidney disease, and she never knew her father. Her grandfather took on the responsibility of raising her to prevent her ending up in an orphanage. He couldn't bear the thought of his granddaughter being alone. Amanda loved her life in the countryside, surrounded by endless wheat fields, open spaces, fragrant hay, and her favourite cat. Her grandfather adored her, and taught her everything he knew, from mowing grass to driving and repairing their old Chevrolet. Together they rebuilt the entire car. By the time Amanda turned sixteen, she could drive as well as any experienced person. She passed her driver's license exam on her first try. Then she decided to move to the city. Amanda realised that there were limited prospects in the village, as young people were leaving, leaving only the elderly residents behind. Her grandfather gave her his small savings, blessed her and wished her well. Amanda rented a room and found a job as a waitress in a small cafe. She didn't particularly enjoy the job, as she was on her feet all day and her back would ache by the end of her shift. However, she needed to make a living somehow. Every day, during her lunch break at the cafe, a young and handsome guy would visit. He always ordered coffee, sandwiches and snacks, taking his time to enjoy them. He couldn't take his eyes off Amanda. The feeling was mutual, and she would feel a bit shy every time she served him. That's how they got to know each other. The guy's name was Stephen, and he worked as a manager in a nearby tour company. He lived with his parents, who worked as clerks in a bank. They were an ordinary family. Stephen showered Amanda with compliments, flirted with her, and one day he brought her a beautiful bouquet of delicate pink daisies, saying, Daisies for my Amanda. You are as beautiful as these flowers. I think about you all the time. I would like to invite you to the movies. I already got two tickets for the premiere. Would you like to come? Amanda agreed with pleasure, her heart racing with excitement, and so the couple began to date. Stephen met Amanda in the evenings after his shift, saw her home, 
and one day decided to stay for good. The girl was ecstatically happy and hoped that they would soon get married, as Stephen had hinted at several times. But everything changed one day when Amanda discovered she was pregnant. She took a test and became a little scared. She and Stephen had not discussed children yet, and there was no wedding planned. She decided to tell Stephen everything in the evening and see how he reacted. Stephen remained silent for a long time and had a frown on his face, clearly displeased with the news. Amanda felt hurt and asked, "'Honey, aren't you happy? "'It's our baby, yours and mine. "'We should hurry and get married before the belly is visible.' "'I suppose so,' Stephen mumbled incoherently. "'It's just too early. "'I thought you were using protection. "'Well, I'll talk to my parents and tell them everything.' But after this conversation, Stephen disappeared. He didn't answer the phone and didn't show up for their lunch at the cafe. Amanda was exhausted and cried her eyes out, unable to understand what had happened. Why was Stephen behaving like this? Did he have a change of heart? Then someone told Amanda something that shattered her. Amanda, don't get upset, but I saw your Stephen yesterday at the mall. He was walking arm in arm with some other woman, whispering sweet nothing. When he saw me, he turned away as if he didn't know me. I could be mistaken, but I think it's clear. Your Stephen has found someone else. Amanda cried uncontrollably, unable to believe it. How could it be? How could he? Maybe it's a mistake. What if she's a relative of his? I have to find out. Otherwise I'll go crazy. Amanda excused herself from work and waited for Stephen outside his office. She waited for two hours. Finally, he came out, but he wasn't alone. He was with apparently the same woman from the mall. They got in a fancy car and started passionately kissing. Amanda's heart sank, and she felt deeply offended. Losing control, she ran towards the car banging on the glass and shouting, "'Cheater!' "'Traitor! What about me? Aren't you ashamed, you scoundrel?' Frightened, Stephen jumped out, pushed Amanda away, and murmured, "'Forgive me, it just happened. Peggy is now my fiancé. My parents decided it. I told them everything, and they forbade me from seeing you. Please go away, Amanda. It's over between us.' Stunned, Amanda slapped Stephen hard and said, "'But I'm pregnant with your child.' What am I supposed to do now? Don't you care? Stephen shrugged and said, Well, I don't know. Go to the hospital and solve the problem. What's the big deal? Amanda, please stop screaming and go away. Then a wealthy woman emerged from the salon, giving Amanda a scornful look and asked, Who is this, Stephen? What does this crazy woman want from you? Stephen pushed Amanda away and replied, it's nothing. She's just mistaken. Peggy approached Amanda, looked her in the eyes, and said harshly, This, sweetie, is mine. I've decided it, and you better not get in my way. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. My father has connections. I've warned you. Stephen and Peggy drove away, dousing Amanda from head to toe with water from the puddle. But the poor girl was standing in the middle of the parking lot, unable to move. It all felt like a nightmare, a terrible dream. Amanda couldn't bring herself to go to work. She cried at home for a week, consumed by grief and betrayal. There were even thoughts of going to the hospital to solve all her problems at once. But she was scared. What if something went wrong, and she couldn't have children at all? How could she live with the guilt of ending a life? On one of those dark days, her neighbour Barry came to visit, asking for a stomach pill for his sick child. He forcefully took her to his home, where his wife joined them. They gave Amanda sedatives, hot tea, and patiently listened to her story. The girl needed someone to talk to, to pour out her soul, because the pain of her lover's betrayal was tearing her heart apart. She told everything without holding back any secrets. Barry listened, shook his head, remained silent, and then quietly asked, 
Well, what a mess. Your Stephen is a jerk. What can I say? What are you going to do? Amanda shrugged her shoulders and replied, I missed a week at the cafe, so I was obviously kicked out. I'll have to go back home to the village, to my grandfather, but I don't know how I'll face him. Shame on me, and I don't know how I'm going to make a living. Barry scratched the back of his head and said, No, going back to the village is not a solution. What will you do there? Milk cows? Listen, you mentioned that you have a driver's license and drive well. Come and work at our taxi company. We're short of drivers. But our boss, Mr. Farris, is very watchful, so you'll need to be diligent. However, you'll earn a good monthly salary if you're not lazy. You can save up money for labor and the baby, and then go on maternity leave. Just keep your pregnancy quiet, because if Mr. Farris finds out, he won't take you. Amanda wiped her tears and looked at her neighbor with gratitude. Thank you, Barry. This is my dream job. I've loved speed and roads since childhood, and I'm a skilled driver. Don't doubt it. I'll start a new life. I've had enough of that cafe. Well, I'll come back tomorrow then, okay? Thank you, guys. I need to hurry and clean myself up. I look like a mess, swollen from crying. Barry's wife patted Amanda on the shoulders and said, Good girl, Amanda. You can't give up. Why should you let this jerk ruin your life? When you give birth to your little one, you'll realize that his happiness is the most important thing to you. Everything will work out, and we'll help you. Don't worry. And so Amanda found herself working at the taxi company. At first, Mr. Farris didn't believe that she would succeed. He questioned how she would handle heavy client luggage and fix the car if something went wrong on the road. But then he saw how confidently Amanda drove and how she could handle car malfunctions on her own. She performed her duties well, so he decided to hire her. The girl perked up and cheered up. Now she had no time to dwell on her pain and cry. The whole day flew by as she drove and interacted with clients. She enjoyed the work, and Amanda ran to it with joy. Her belly wasn't visible yet, and she wore loose sports hoodies and sweatshirts, so she could continue working almost until her maternity leave. Luckily, her health didn't let her down, and she didn't suffer much from morning sickness. Occasionally, her back would ache from sitting for long periods, but it was still better than carrying trays. The only thing that bothered Amanda was the intrusive and greedy owner. At the end of each shift, he demanded a minute-by-minute -minute report. He even installed cameras in the cabin to monitor how the drivers interacted with customers and to ensure money wasn't being mishandled. Despite this, the team was excellent, and Amanda found that it was easier to work with men. There was no gossip or drama. Everyone was focused on their work. She remained friends with Barry, and they would drink tea from a thermos and talk about life. Today, Amanda had a lucrative order. She needed to drive far out of the city to pick up a client. The client promised to pay well just to be back in the city, so the earnings were expected to be good due to the long distance. Amanda was in a great mood, humming a song as she drove towards the client. She was already planning where she would place the crib and where to buy an affordable stroller. She calculated how much she needed for all these preparations. She tried not to dwell on the treacherous Stephen, although it was difficult. Sometimes tears would well up in her throat. However, she focused on her future and the upcoming arrival of her baby. Upon arriving at the requested location, Amanda's mood quickly faded. She found herself in a huge country mansion where a wild party was taking place. The client was extremely drunk and kept changing his mind about getting into the cab. Ten minutes later, the homeowner cancelled the call. The girl felt upset because she had wasted gas and time without earning any income. She knew that Mr. Farris would scold her for this, but it wasn't her fault. Besides, the weather worsened with heavy rain pouring down from the frowning sky, further dampening Amanda's mood. She was halfway to town when suddenly a tramp emerged from the woods. 
He staggered from side to side, covered in mud and dried blood. The girl couldn't just pass him by, so she slowed down. She decided that if he was drunk, she wouldn't pick him up, but she wanted to see what was wrong with him. The girl put on her hooded jacket and jumped out of the car. She ran up to the man and took a closer look. Hey, are you sick? May I help you? Where are you going? If you're headed to the city, I can give you a ride. The man looked at her with cloudy eyes and whispered weakly, Help me. And after that, he lost his consciousness and fell by the roadside. He didn't smell of alcohol, that was for sure. Amanda slapped his cheeks, pleading, Wake up! I can't get you to the car alone. Come on! Let's go up carefully. After much effort, the girl managed to get the wretched man into the car and drove him to the hospital. Along the way, she tried to find out more about him, but he only said that his name was Mitchell and moaned in pain. Amanda handed her passenger over to the medical staff, ensuring he was properly cared for. As she bid him goodbye, she said, Well, I helped as much as I could. Get well. All the best to you. The girl hurried back to the taxi park, realizing that she had been delayed and worried that Mr. Farris would be angry. She had forgotten about the camera in the salon, but her boss was sitting in his office, watching all her movements. He was furious and reprimanded her as soon as she arrived. What do you think you're doing? You refused to drive the client, wasted my gasoline, and spent half a day driving around homeless people. I lost so much money because of you. Amanda was almost in tears as she defended herself. Why are you talking to me like that? By what right? The client wasn't well and cancelled the ride. And this poor man, I picked him up on the way back. What was I supposed to do? Leave him to die on the highway? Enraged, Mr. Farris shouted even more. You'll pay for saving that tramp out of your own pocket. I'll deduct the cost of the gasoline from your salary and take away your bonus, so others won't get similar ideas. Now get back to work. You're all out of control, doing whatever you want. And don't forget to clean the car. It's covered in dirt. How will decent people get in it now? Amanda angrily washed the car, thinking to herself, Well, that's how you get rewarded for doing good deeds. You're left with nothing. What a scoundrel Mr. Farris is. Nothing is sacred. Exhausted and sad, she finished her shift, went home, and fell asleep immediately after taking a shower. She had no energy left. The next morning, Amanda was awoken by a knocking on her door. She was surprised to find three well-dressed men, two of them bodyguards, standing outside. An unpleasant older man, clearly the big boss, entered without invitation and greeted her. "'Good morning. Your name is Amanda, isn't it? You saved my son yesterday, picked him up on the road and sent him to the hospital. I'm truly grateful to you. Thank you for not letting a man die.' Saying this, he placed a puffy envelope on the table. Amanda waved her hands in amazement, saying, "'No need. I just felt sorry for him. The poor guy was badly beaten, barely able to walk and was in rags.' How did he end up in that wooded area? The businessman seemed taken aback by the question, but still answered, You understand, it's an unpleasant story. My son was kidnapped by bandits and held captive in a cabin in the woods. He managed to escape miraculously and tried to make his way home. Did he say anything to you on the way? Amanda shook her head. No, he didn't. He was in a lot of pain and only introduced himself as Mitchell. That's all. The man grinned and said, Well, that's probably the best news today. All right, we gotta go. Take the money. Have a good day. Goodbye. The trio left, and Amanda ran to the window and gasped. There was a whole motorcade of jeeps outside. She counted four of them. The girl counted the money. There was a huge sum, by her standards clearly not a simple gratitude. She pondered. Her sleep was gone. No, something's wrong. First of all, this glossy big shot doesn't look like his father. Not a drop of worry, regret for the fate of his son. 
His eyes are cold and calculating. Close people don't act like that. Secondly, why did he ask so much if his son had spoken up? So there's something to hide. Thirdly, how did this man learn everything about me so quickly? And most importantly, why did he come to me? And perhaps this money is not gratitude at all, but payment for my silence. No, I must go to the hospital again and check on Mitchell. I should find out from him what happened to him. Luckily, today is my day off anyway. Amanda bought some goodies on the way and went to the trauma department, where she left Mitchell yesterday, but she was not allowed. Why can't I visit my friend? I won't be long. I'll ask how he's doing, and that's all. Let me in for a little while, please. The doctor himself came down to her and strictly said, Unfortunately, we can't let you in to see Mitchell Liebman. He suddenly fell into a coma and is now in the intensive care unit, and it is forbidden to enter there. You have nothing to do there, excuse me. The girl was shocked. Come, yesterday he was weak and beaten, but he was walking on his own feet, and now all of a sudden he's in a coma? What's wrong with him? The doctor waved her away angrily. Why should I report to you? Who are you to him? His father's with him. He knows everything. They'll let you know when you can visit his son, but for now his condition is extremely serious. I don't have time to argue with you. I have other patients waiting for me. Have a wonderful day. Amanda was very upset and already began to leave the hospital, but then she was caught up by the post nurse. She took Amanda to some back room and began to whisper. It's not as the doctor said. You're Mitchell's fiance, aren't you? I guessed it right away. Well, there's something wrong here. He's not in some kind of coma. He's just being dosed with some powerful remedy, and it's unclear why and wherefore. But I noticed that that respectable man, who seemed to be his father, gave our doctor a big envelope with money and asked him to make sure that Mitchell never left the hospital. Not at all. I treated his wounds yesterday. It was nothing serious. I think the doctor sold his soul to the devil, because he is an avid gambler and he needs money. I know this because I have a cousin who suffers from this addiction. I have seen the doctor several times in the casino when I took my cousin out of there. I told you the truth, but don't give me away, okay? Or they'll fire me or destroy me. All right, I'm off. Amanda was in shock. She didn't know what to do. How to help Mitchell? She scolded herself. Well, I got involved in a story again. I have many problems myself, and I'm worried about other people's problems. What a stupid character I have. The girl was tormented with worries and doubts all night, not sleeping a wink, and by morning she decided for sure that she would not be able to live peacefully if she did not save Mitchell. After all, the guy was her age. Why should he die? It's not right. It's not fair. Amanda's first impulse was to run to the police and tell them everything she knew. But then she changed her mind. After all, if the rich man had so much money and connections to buy everyone and everything, then in the police he probably has his own people. And what could she charge him with? It's all just rumours so far. No proof. The worst part was that there was no one to consult. And then Amanda remembered that nurse, Deborah. So she decided to talk to her again, setting up a meeting at a cafe. Surprised, Deborah arrived on time. Amanda was the first to start. I'm sorry to bother you again. It's just that I have no one else to turn to. I can't tell anybody about something like this. They won't believe it. So I beg you to help me to save Mitchell. I want to get him out of the hospital. I can get a car. I can drive. But how can I get him out? He's in a coma right now. Deborah paused for a moment, then replied, OK, let's think this through. I have the night shift the day after tomorrow. It'll be Saturday in the ward with a few people on duty. In addition, the Mitchell's doctor has Sunday off. I can refrain from giving that remedy. So the patient will wake up, 
in about 12 to 16 hours. I'll provide you with a white coat, a cap, and a mask to ensure that no one recognizes you. We can also give you a name tag that states you're a doctor. We'll attempt to handle this on our own. I'm hesitant to involve anyone else because I don't fully trust anyone. The only thing left is to figure out what to say when they come looking for him, which will likely happen during my shift. I can't even imagine the trouble I'll be in. I could be fired for this. But you know what? Let them let go of me. Amanda let out a heavy sigh and responded. I don't have a plan. I'll take him to my place, as there's nowhere else. Once he wakes up and tells us who kidnapped him and why, we'll go to the prosecutor's office and let them handle it all. They agreed on that plan. Amanda had been so nervous for the past days that she could barely focus during her work. And on the designated day, she trembled occasionally. She was terrified of what might go wrong. What if it didn't work? What if Mitchell didn't wake up at her house? But it was too late to retreat. And on the appointed night, Amanda turned off the camera after the last order and drove to the hospital. She changed her clothes as Deborah had told her to, crossed herself, exhaled, and went straight to the ICU. Deborah was already waiting for her in the ward. Together they placed Mitchell on a gurney and hurriedly took him towards the exit. The gurney rattled on the tiled floor of the deserted corridor, causing Amanda's heart to race. She silently prayed that no one would approach and question their actions. Thankfully, they were fortunate that everything went smoothly. At this late hour, all the patients were already asleep, including the doctor on duty, once they placed Mitchell in the back seat of the car, Deborah quickly turned to her post, whispering a goodbye to Amanda. Be careful, Amanda. I wish you and your fiancé a speedy recovery. I've packed the necessary medications and written down the instructions and diet on a sheet of paper. Now, I'm going to hurry before they find me. Amanda drove like a madwoman, her heart pounding. She felt like a criminal constantly looking around and fearing that someone might be following her. When she reached her house, she called Barry, her neighbour, and whispered urgently into the receiver. Barry, could you come out for a minute? I need your help. I apologise for being so late. The man was shocked when he saw the unconscious guy in the back seat. Amanda pleaded, Help me. Don't just stand there. I can't lift him by myself. We need to get him to my room. Just don't ask me anything, okay? I'll explain everything later, I promise. Without hesitation, Barry helped carry Mitchell into the room and placed him on the sofa. He asked, What are you doing, Amanda? Why did you bring him here? Did you also take the car from the taxi company? Mr. Farris will be furious. Did anyone see you? Amanda shook her head, replying, Nobody saw me. I turned off the camera. I'll turn it back on. You won't betray me, will you? I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm trying to save this man's life. Do you believe me? Barry simply waved his hand and said, I know you're a good person, and you wouldn't harm anyone. Of course I believe you, but please keep me out of your business. I have a family and two children. I won't tell anyone, but I don't want to know too much. I'm going home. I did what I could. Amanda returned the car to the taxi company without any issues. The guards treated her well, and she was confident that they wouldn't report her. However, she couldn't stop trembling from the events and emotions of this evening. The girl arrived home on the last bus, checked that Mitchell was breathing evenly, and collapsed beside him exhausted. She was worried and cried. God, what have I gotten myself into? Barry is right. It's very dangerous. And if this rich man finds me, what will happen to me? What about Mitchell? I don't even have anyone to protect me. It's not life. It's a detective story. And I'm starring in it. How scary. But at least I saved a man. That's something to be happy about. Thirteen hours passed and Mitchell finally regained consciousness. He squinted from the sun and looked around, disoriented. Excuse me. Girl, where am I? Why am I not in the hospital? Oh, I seem to remember you. You're the cab driver who saved me on the highway. I never said thank you. 
Amanda grinned and replied, I'll tell you such a story that you'll have to thank me again, though I'm taking a big risk, but still. The girl proceeded to tell Mitchell everything she knew about his alleged father, the drugs he had been given, and her own pregnancy. She needed to share it all with someone to free her soul. The young man listened attentively, not interrupting, and remained silent for a long time. Then he began to tell his own story. Yes, he is not my father. But to make you understand, I'll start from my birth. It's a long and complicated story. My parents were very wealthy. My father was a businessman who owned a network of hotels in the city and region. My mother was a psychologist who helped famous people. So when I was three years old, my father faced my bandits, who threatened to kill him and the family if he didn't give the business to them. That's when my dad wrote his will, stating that all his property and money would belong to me when I turned 25. I think it was because of this that all the fuss broke out. I'm turning 25 in a month. My father had a close companion named Hank Long, who was also a distant relative. My father trusted him completely. After the threats, the criminals attacked my father and shot him in the car. Mum, from grief and stress, went sick. She had always had a weak heart and passed away soon after. I was left orphaned at the age of three. Mr. Long, my father's companion, took me in and became my guardian. He is the one who visited you. Mr. Long took control of my father's business and always made me feel indebted to him for not sending me to an orphanage. He treated me indifferently, neither loving nor harming me. When I was 13, he married a young woman, and I became even more of a burden. I was sent to study at a prestigious private school in England, and then went on to university. Finally, I began to return home and start my own business. However, my stepfather wanted to continue controlling me. I accidentally discovered the existence of my father's will when I visited my former nanny. She had been with me during those difficult times and knew everything but kept silent. Then I had a disagreement with my stepfather and started looking for the notary who had the will, and that's when everything went wrong. I began receiving threatening phone calls, telling me to leave town. I didn't pay much attention to them at first, but a week later... I was kidnapped by some bandits. They kept me captive in an abandoned cabin in the forest, beating me and demanding to refute the will. Luckily, I managed to escape. The opportunity presented itself when one of the bandits left and I requested to go to the bathroom. Normally, they would take me out with two guys. We moved away from the cabin and I seized the moment to fight back. I don't remember exactly how I broke free and ran, I hid in a hole covered with leaves and stayed there for 24 hours. Eventually I made it out and wandered aimlessly until I found the road, and that's where you found me. Now, I have no doubt who was behind my kidnapping and who benefited from abandoning me. Amanda splashed her hands. It's obvious, Mitchell, of course it's your stepfather. Who else? We must immediately go to the police, prosecutor's office, and sound the alarm. After all, he will not rest until he eliminates you. Mitchell evasively replied, That's right, I just don't understand why my stepfather didn't try to eliminate me before when I was still a child. After all, in the will, there is an addition that if I cannot inherit for some reason, Mr. Long will get everything. Amanda replied, So you are incredibly lucky and your stepfather simply didn't know about the existence of the will and learned about it only from you recently. But I'm sure he had something to do with your abduction. I saw his eyes, cold, calculating and evil. Amanda took Mitchell to the prosecutor's office, where he told them all about his misfortunes, and then they went to the police. The wheel of justice spun, and a criminal case was opened. After a long and painstaking investigation, horrifying details from the past surfaced. It turned out that Mr. Long not only organised and paid for the kidnapping of Mitchell, 
but also had a hand in the murder of his father. Mitchell could not believe it. He was shaking. He asked the investigator to arrange a meeting with his stepfather. He wanted to look him in the eye and ask him just one question. Why? The guy thought that now his stepfather would repent and ask for forgiveness because he was facing a life sentence. But no, this scoundrel behaved brazenly and swaggered. Well, Mitchell, are you happy now? Yes, I'm getting old. I'm getting sentimental. I was weak. And they didn't kill you at once there in the forest. I was dragging you along. You were like a son to me. The guy choked with such insolence. A son, you say? How can you say such a thing? You've been telling me since childhood that you would find my father's killers, that you were grieving for them, that you were grateful to him. But you gave the order to eliminate him with your own hands. Because of you, my mum died soon after. You ruined my life. Why didn't you eliminate me before? Why did you pay for me to stay in a private school for so many years? You never loved me, I know. You just tolerated me. The businessman grinned wickedly. I felt sorry for you at first, so I sent you away to study. In addition, I had an impeccable reputation in high society because I took to educate the son of my late partner. It kept suspicion away from me, and I was respected by everyone. And now you've come back to spoil my plans. It was only when you blabbed about the will recently that I got my head in my hands. I couldn't let you get everything. Too regal a gift. I've spent all these years developing the business, investing my time and energy, and now it's all going to go to you. No way. I thought of everything. I calculated everything. But you managed to escape from the forest cabin while I was still hesitating whether to get rid of you now or later. And I would have succeeded if it hadn't been for that stupid cab driver. First she picked you up on the road, and then she drove you out of the hospital. I hate her. That viper ruined my whole plan. Mitchell was outraged. Don't you dare insult Amanda. She's the best girl in the world. She saved my life twice from you, by the way, Daddy. Well, you'll never get away with it now. You'll pay for everything. Mr. Long pitched forward and hissed angrily. You are very wrong, puppy. I have such connections, such opportunities, that I'll be free again very soon. You'll see. But the court decided everything justly, and the businessman, murderer, received a harsh punishment. Now, instead of a luxurious happy life, a prison cell awaited him for the rest of his life. He shouted in court how much he hated Amanda, blamed her for everything. After all, it was she who prevented him from becoming even richer and more successful, and saved his unloved stepson. Mitchell stood at the helm of the company, and plunged headlong into work. He and Amanda often saw each other, were friends and socialised. In fact, the guy was secretly in love with the girl. He had never met anyone like her before. He admired everything about this laughing, snub-nosed, mischievous young woman, her cheerful laugh, her floppy ears and beautiful wheaten curls, and her kind, affectionate eyes. However, he couldn't confess his feelings because she was pregnant with another man's child and preparing for childbirth. He believed that if he confessed now, he would insult her and destroy their warm, trusting relationship. So Mitchell chose to take care of her and support her instead. He insisted that Amanda move out of her tiny old housing, and he rented a cosy apartment for her. He also urged her to stop working as a taxi driver, since her growing belly made it impossible to hide the pregnancy, and her employer, Mr. Farris, wouldn't pay her maternity leave and might even terminate her retroactively. Mitchell provided financial assistance to Amanda and made sure she had everything she needed. The girl felt very uncomfortable with the level of care. Mitchell, you spoil me so much. No one has ever cared for me like this. Thank you so much. It's a pity I had to quit driving a cab I really enjoyed that job. Sitting in four walls is boring. 
Quietly, Mitchell replied while looking into her eyes. Amanda, this is the least I can do for you. You are not a stranger to me now. In fact, you are the closest person to me. Don't worry, soon you'll give birth to a baby boy, and there won't be a dull moment. I'll be there to pick you up from the hospital. Will you take me as the godfather? Amanda was moved to tears and replied softly, Of course. What are you even asking? You know, Mitchell, I feel so comfortable and calm with you, more than with anyone else. Why didn't we meet earlier? It's a pity. Nothing can change that. Amanda's heart was also filled with love for Mitchell. She was drawn to him like a magnet, but she didn't dare to entertain such thoughts. She kept reminding herself, Don't dream about him. Why would he want someone else's child? Don't ruin his life. But then, why does he care about me so much? Not every husband would do that. Is it just out of gratitude? I have to convince myself that he's just a friend. That's all. There can never be anything more between us. Amanda exhausted herself with worries and doubts, and there was no one she could talk to about it. One day, while walking from the women's clinic, she ran into Deborah, the nurse who had helped her save Mitchell. Both women were delighted to see each other and decided to have lunch at a cafe and talk about everything. Oh dear, pregnancy suits you, Deborah said with a laugh. You look so much better, positively glowing. Well, tell me, how did your detective story with the kidnapping end? I've thought of you often. I almost got fired and was scolded for a long time. I had to write an explanation letter, and they revoked my bonus, but it was worth it. You should have seen the doctor's face when he couldn't find his paid patient in the morning. Oh, what an uproar. Eventually, the investigation started, and our corrupt doctor was finally removed from his position. He was scared and tried to dodge, hoping everyone would keep silent about his dark deeds but many people were tired of his actions. He also got sentenced and is now in jail. He deserves it. And I even got promoted to head nurse. That's right. So, I have to thank you. Amanda smiled and said, Congratulations, you deserve it. I've thought of you often too. Sometimes you just want to talk to someone, knowing that they will understand and listen without judgment. As for my pregnancy... It's a complicated story. Amanda told Deborah everything about her ex-boyfriend. Deborah only shook her head and wondered. You're really something, my friend. I admire you, to be honest. You're so brave. Decided to take a risk for the sake of strangers and even being pregnant. It's worth a lot. Your Mitchell should kiss your feet. And take my advice. Don't gnaw yourself. Don't torment in vain and just trust your heart and fate. Everything will be as it should be, believe me. Give birth to a baby, love him, grow. It is the greatest happiness. If Mitchell really loves you, sooner or later he will reveal this, and the child is not a hindrance. I was foolish in my youth. I had a fight with my fiancé, and I terminated my pregnancy quickly without thinking. I took a sin on my soul. And now, I'm 37 and I have neither children nor a husband. Do you know how many times I've regretted what I did? I could have raised a baby and not felt lonely. That's right, you're a good fighter. Way to go. Amanda took Deborah's hand and said, Deborah, thank you for all you have done for me. Please visit me from time to time. I'd be pleased to. Honestly, I've never had any real friends and I trust you. I feel you're a good person. So, let's be friends. Deborah rejoiced. I'm all for it. I have Sunday off. If you like, let's go for a walk. Let's look for some interesting baby things, fashionable strollers, and we'll have a chat. From that day on, Amanda and Deborah became thick as thieves. The women had a lot to talk about. They were somehow close to each other internally, just like sisters. When Amanda had contractions in the middle of the night, she did not hesitate to call her. Deborah, I apologise for calling at night. I think it started. My belly hurts so much. Then squeeze. Then let go. No strength. I'm so scared. What should I do? Deborah woke up immediately and started giving her commands. First of all, calm down. 
I will now organize you a transport, and you get dressed, get ready, and wait for me. I'll be right back. Do not forget the most important things and documents. And remember, everything's going to be okay. Dr. Brewster is a great obstetrician, and she is on shift today, and I'll be there for you. Then Deborah called Mitchell herself. Wake up, Romeo. Your Juliet is giving birth. Let's go to help. Already in thirty minutes, Amanda was taken to the labor room. Deborah and Mitchell stayed waiting in the corridor. The man was very nervous, paced back and forth, and all inquired, "Deborah, you are a medical professional. Tell me, Amanda will be all right. Why hasn't she given birth yet? Maybe something went wrong." The nurse started to cheer him up. Pour some coffee from the machine and calm down. You men are so fast that this process can even last for twenty-four hours. Better admit, do you love her? Mitchell was embarrassed, but answered honestly, "Very much, more than life, and I don't know what to do about it." Deborah laughed. "No, you're hilarious. What is there to think? If you love, get married and raise the boy with her." You both are so funny. Suffer in the corners and pretend that you are just friends. Mitchell got excited, and you think she loves me too? Honestly, I'm afraid to tell her. I think I might offend her. I can't sleep or eat. She's always in my head. Deborah confirmed. Yes, she does. Believe me. Be more decisive, Mitchell. We girls are romantic natures. We always expect the first step from a man. Finally, a nurse came out and announced, "Well, Daddy, congratulations! You have got a big boy." Amanda barely gave birth to him. Thank God, all without complications. Deborah winked to Mitchell. "Well, I told you everything will be fine. Go get some sleep, you lucky boy, and I'll try, as a medical professional, to check on my friend. I'm allowed to." Amanda smiled blissfully as she held her baby close to her chest. All the pain and agony she had endured during the hours of labor seemed insignificant now. As she looked at her son, the name Mark came to her mind effortlessly. It didn't matter who the father was; what mattered was that he was her own flesh and blood. Her life was forever changed, no longer belonging to just herself. The door opened, and Deborah entered the room, quietly approaching her friend. She kissed Amanda and exclaimed, "Congratulations, Amanda! Who do we have here? Look how serious he is, frowning like an old man. Come on, smile." Amanda laughed and replied, "Well, to be honest, it wasn't easy. The doctors were concerned that I couldn't do it on my own, but Mark and I pushed through, and now here he is, my little miracle. Where's Mitchell? Did he go home?" Deborah chuckled and said, "I doubt he left." You should have seen how worried he was about you. He paced like a caged tiger, bombarding me with questions. He loves you, Amanda. That's for sure. I think he'll propose to you soon. Will I be your maid of honor? Amanda's heart skipped a beat, and she exclaimed, "You think so? I am so grateful that both of you are here. That you both appeared in my life. I was pregnant and alone, with only my neighbor's support." Deborah smiled and said. I'll be happy to babysit the little serious baby. I know he will grow fond of me. On a discharging day, Mitchell arrived dressed in an expensive suit with a bouquet of flowers. Deborah had been with Amanda all morning, helping her get ready, curling her with a curling iron and teasing her. Your Romeo is downstairs, waiting impatiently. Confused, Amanda asked, "Deborah, what is all this? It feels like we're getting ready for a party." I'm just being discharged. Why all the expensive outfits? The nurse chuckled and replied, "Who knows? Who knows? One thing I can tell you is that you're in for a surprise." As Amanda stepped outside, Mitchell rushed to her, while Deborah took little Mark in her arms. Mitchell took out from his pocket a beautiful box and opened it. "Dear Amanda, I congratulate you on the birth of your son." I want to put this ring on your finger as a symbol that we are more than friends now. I love you, darling, and I want you to become my wife. Will you marry me? The nurses applauded, 
and the sound of a champagne bottle being opened filled the air. Even the elderly janitor paused his work to witness the scene. Overwhelmed with emotions, Amanda sobbed and whispered, I agree, I love you too and I can't help it. Deborah clapped her hands and shouted, Cheers! as she raised a glass of champagne. She was genuinely happy that two loving hearts were finally united. Amanda moved into Mitchell's mansion, and the couple officially tied the knot. Mitchell adopted Mark, giving him his surname. Three years passed. Amanda and Mitchell lived harmoniously. Amanda deeply appreciated her husband's loyalty, devotion, generosity, and care, and she never regretted marrying Mitchell. One February, amidst the cold frosts and snowstorms, Mitchell suddenly suggested, Darling, why don't we go to a warm sea, to a resort? What's stopping us? We'll warm ourselves in the sun. What do you think? Amanda squealed with joy. Of course I'm for it. I've never been abroad, but I'd love to. You're the best. Mark, we're going to the sea. Are you happy? Mark clapped his hands, and the packing started. The couple visited a travel agency to select a suitable tour. The receptionist, a friendly girl, greeted them warmly, offered them coffee, and tried to assist them. She said, We're delighted that you've chosen our agency. Our manager, Stephen, will assist you. Five minutes later, Mitchell and Amanda sat down in comfortable chairs, and Amanda was holding Mark in her arms, while they waited for the manager. When the manager approached them, Amanda greeted him but didn't immediately recognise why he seemed familiar. Upon closer inspection, she realised that it was her ex-boyfriend, Stephen. It turned out that he hadn't made any career advancements over the years and remained a manager, just as he was before. Amanda quickly remembered their breakup and decided to play along by pretending not to remember him. She coolly said, My husband, son and I would like to choose a family tour to the sea. What options do you have to offer? But Stephen was visibly flustered and unable to provide a proper response. His mind was consumed with thoughts like, Is that gorgeous woman really that plain waitress, Amanda? It can't be. Her husband must be wealthy, and the baby is so adorable. It even resembles me. Wait, she was pregnant when I left her. What if he's my son? Lost in his thoughts, Stephen barely heard Mitchell's voice saying, Hey, man, are you even listening to me? I've been telling you for an hour when we want to go, and you're just mumbling to yourself. Maybe we should try another agency instead. I'm dissatisfied with this type of service. However, Stephen acted as if he hadn't heard and exhaled before deciding. Amanda, don't you recognize me? It's me, Stephen. Tell me, is this my son? What's his name? Mitchell raised an eyebrow and answered stiffly. This is my son, Mark Liebman. Any more questions? You're obviously out of your mind. Amanda, let's get out of here. We've wasted our time. He's crazy. Amanda calmly replied, don't get excited, my love. The man has made a mistake. Mitchell took his wife by the elbow and his son by the hand, and they left the agency. Stephen got a big shock, losing such clients and such a woman. After all, Peggy had left him a long time ago. He never made a career, and he still lived with his parents. The only entertainment for him was beer and soccer on weekends. That was how life went on. Today, seeing Amanda so radiant and happy, he suddenly felt offended and angry with himself. Now his son called another man Daddy and loved him, not Stephen. And what was he left with? There were few people willing to marry a simple manager without a place to live and any prospects. Only Amanda had loved him so sincerely and devotedly. If only he could turn back time. He would never have let her go. But it was too late for that. Amanda and Mitchell went on vacation, enjoying the sun and water, coming back completely happy and satisfied. And a month later, they received another surprise. Amanda found out that she was pregnant. Mitchell hugged and kissed her, spinning around and rejoicing like a child. And Amanda thought to herself, If someone had told me that I would meet a tramp on the road, marry him and have his child, 
I wouldn't have believed it. And now I'm the happiest I've ever been. That's fate. Soon Amanda decided to play matchmaker for her best friend and introduced her to Mitchell's friend and partner, Andrew. It turned out to be a great decision. They had a passionate romance and soon Deborah also became pregnant. Now Mitchell and Amanda joyfully shouted, Cheers! at their best friend's wedding, wishing them only happiness. The two couples often gathered for joint vacations, grilling kebabs, playing board games, and simply enjoying a friendly and fun time together. To be loved is more valuable than being rich, because being loved means being happy. Everyone knows this truth, but not everyone is fortunate enough to experience love and be loved in life. However, our heroes managed to achieve it.